All right. Welcome back to our webinar for a certified fire protection specialist exam preparation. And we are now in a module. Uh, actually, it's module 15, the fire alarm basics. So let us start. So in this training, we will uh, allow you to locate and apply the requirements according to NP72. And uh, many different uh, people and groups uh, have an interest uh, in the fire alarm system, maybe like you. And it's have some level of expertise or knowledge that can be beneficial. While no one is an expert at all, at the end of this training, you will be more uh, knowledgeable and uh, better up able to apply your skills to the next parallel system. And uh, this lesson will introduce the content and navigation of this uh, course. And uh, obviously we will use here the NPA 72 that covers the supervising station uh, alarm system, public emergency alarm, reporting system and fire warning equipment uh, it reflects the input of an industry whose interest is to create the highest standard possible to assure the proper function of this system. Uh, the NPA 72 is actually different from some code which are product of a singular point of view. A building code official for uh, example. <clears throat> and the purpose of NPA 72 is to define how the system initiate a signal in response to some condition. And the code also define how the signal is transmitted to responder and how notification appliance and initiators are used to alert and inform the people. <coughs> <coughs> And the purpose of the code is also include defining the level of performance and reliability of the various type of fire alarm, supervising station, public emergency, uh, fire and carbon monoxide detection and warning equipment and emergency communication system, including the components. There is a term provision. Remember that provisions are prescriptive meaning it is uh, normally required with performance-based design method. Risk analysis are provided and essential for the proper design and integration of bus notification system. So what is our module, okay, uh, in this uh, lesson? To describe the key characteristics of fire, and how they can use to initiate the fire alarm. Identify the key terms according to NP72, which is your fire alarm code. Explain why fire safety is a system. And list the step and stakeholders in the life cycle of a fire alarm. <clears throat> fire alarm basics provide you with a greater understanding of how the fire detection and alarm are required by building and life safety codes review how different situations dictate different uh, the system feature. Here we will discuss the uh, three lessons, an overview of terminology, detection and alarm, and control units power supply. So let us discuss the overview and some of the <coughs> technology. So here, our learning objective, <coughs> number one is to explain how building fire and life safety codes impact the requirements for fire detection and alarm. Describe the relation between building fire and life safety code. Determine any PA 72 issues to build a fire detection and alarm and how NPA 72 is structured 
and specific terms used in this code. NPA 72, guys, is referenced by other codes, laws, or regulations such as number one, building code in life safety, number two, fire code, elevator, mechanical, and other NPA 72 codes and standard, and especially local authority, local codes, ordinates, including regulations, you know, like civil defense. And the system, these documents that require that those system and feature are designed, installed, uh, tested, inspected, and maintained according to NPA 72 uh, code. Okay. And remember, uh, NPA 72 is the standard of care in the industry. So what is the meaning of standard of care? Meaning it is the standard that a component, competent professional, I mean, would be expected to comply in the execution of this work, even if it is not explicitly required by uh, other code standard or regulatory agency or law. <clears throat> and this enabled documents will require some form of fire alarm or signaling system, typically dictate that a system have certain feature such as smoke detector, sprinkler system, and occupant notification using audible and visual appliance. Now the question is, select all choices that reference to NPA 72. As what we discussed, it applies everything to NPA 72. The fire code, building and life safety code, mechanical, elevator code, and various uh, uh, building code and standard. So the answer is on. Okay. Let us discuss the requirements for fire detection, alarm, and signaling. It is the requirement to have a certain fire detection and alarm uh, in the building, the life safety and fire code, or in honor set of requirements, how and why do the feature of this system differ? The requirements of the building and the life safety and fire codes are organized based on the type of occupancy or the use of the property. If you see, no, it can be based on building height, type of construction, the occupant load, whether there are automatic fire sprinkler or suppression system or not, and affect the feature of fire detection, alarm, and signaling, signaling system. For example, our compartmented building with a complete automatic sprinkler might not require to have a smoke detection. And normally we discuss it uh, in the very beginning of our uh, module, some of the school and apartment, okay, if there are, uh, for example, or daycare, uh, if there are uh, a sprinkler, maybe you can omit having this. But it might still require a complete occupant notification to transmit alarm to an off-premise location. On the other hand, residential occupancy such as apartment building that do not have automatic sprinkler might require uh, an automatic smoke detection in the common area and smoke alarm in the apartment. So what are the relationship between the code, the system, and the product standard? The code is law regulation, ordinance, or code that establish the requirements for construction and fire safety. On the other hand, the system standard provides a detailed application, installation, location, performance, and maintenance of what is required by the code. And the product standard is uh, about listing agency standard. So let's say the <coughs> UL no? standard, under, underwriter lab, laboratory ensure product safety, reliability, and certain performance. And maybe the law or regulatory agency might require you to comply 
pay the system and uh, the product standard. Now, the big difference between the code and standard, the code tells you what you need to do and standard tells you how to do. So the standard provides the guidance no? and the code provides you the requirements. For example, the code may say that the building must have a fire alarm. So there's no enough detail, okay? But the standard will uh, specify clearly what kind of system or what kind of uh, fire alarm is an adequate based on the type of uh, application or uh, the type of occupancy and how it will work. For example, let's look at smoke detection at hallway required by building code. Correct spacing is required, but code egress requirements and performance standards are balanced to meet society desired goal. Greater spacing means lower response. Therefore, the situation requires more sensitive detection a better egress path. And uh, these three should work together, no? The building and life safety code, the system standards such as NPA 72 and product standards such as UL or FM. No? So the three components like NPA 72 and others should work together in order to be balanced. If one change, one or both others must change, meaning there should be a synchronization. And alternatively, one or more of these components can be intentionally changed to affect the system response. And note that it is important to understand and account for the planning, design, installation, testing until the use uh, during the operation and maintenance of that uh, particular equipment or device. And uh, NPA 72, your system standard, covers the following. An application, installation, location, performance, inspection, testing, and again during the building, post occupancy, no? maintenance, operational maintenance of the system. No? The purpose of the code shall to define the means of signal initiation and the transmission of the signal and notifying the potential affected parties and how it will be announced. No? using the annunciation devices and the level of performance required, let's say the, the amount of uh, sound density or uh, light density required no? and reliability of various type of fire alarm, supervising station alarm, the public emergency alarm, fire and carbon monoxide detection and emergency communication system and other appurtenances or components. Okay. Now let us discuss the requirements for the fire detection, alarm, and signaling. Now, remember, guys, that the code specified the requirements for the protected premises based on the type of occupancy or facility now, using the fire alarm according to your system standard, which is the uh, NPA 72. Emergency forces notification such as the civil defense and single and multi-station smoke alarm and household fire alarm. I think single or a multi-dwelling unit. Okay. Protected premises fire alarm. And normally your NPA 72 list 10 specific requirements for fire alarm in a protected premises. Protected means either protected with the fire alarm, with annunciation system and a fire suppression system and include how our alarm will be initiated manually. No? Sometimes our uh, devices might not work properly. So maybe we will have a manual fire alarm box or a pull station, no? manual pull station, or automatic using smoke or heat detector. You know, sometimes uh, uh, either it will give you false alarm, meaning it will alarm even without uh, <clears throat> apparent fire hazard no? or there's no apparent smoke. Uh, sometimes because of the dust blockage, it's also give false alarm. But anyway, the code specify how the occupants will be notified in case of initiating the audible notification appliance such as horn and visual notification as appliance such as strobe. No? Sometimes 
and some application, the horn and strobe are no, coming together. No? If the cause require automatic sprinkler or other suppression device, they will require the no system be monitored or supervised by the protected fire alarm system. So it's like this, guys, no, like pre-action. So, so your pre-action uh, uh, bulb or deluge bulb will not uh, uh, pump, uh, so, so will not uh, switch on the pump or compressor uh, if it will not trigger the, it will not relay a signal to your uh, pump uh, to, to, to pump water if uh, the smoke detector or heat detector is not uh, uh, <coughs> triggered no, or activated. Uh, sometimes uh, at least second stage alarm no because first stage alarm normally false false alarm no okay so the code specify how the occupants will be notified in case of so we discuss <clears throat> emergency forces notification the code will also require emergency forces notification using one of the methods detailed in NFP 72 and the protected premises using fire alarm might also transmit trouble and super, supervisory signal or premises so that the property owner or service company is alerted to the need to take appropriate action. So this emergency forces notification uh, in Qatar normally it is only connected to civil defense. The problem that if there is a false alarm and if it is if, it, if, the, if this will trigger the fire department to come in your area and if without uh, uh, apparent danger you might be penalized no i heard it's about at least 4500000 uh, 4000 to 5000 real i am not really sure about the figure no so you have to be very very careful for any system integrated with the you know with the first responder like civil depends you might be penalized if there is a, a false alarm no and the single multiple station smoke alarm in a household for alarm within the dwelling or residential unit such as home, apartment, hotel, condominium, the building life safety and code require fire detection and alert for the occupants that is independent of a protected premises. And the details for these requirements is mentioned also in the separate chapter of NPA 72. <coughs> so there are <coughs> There are uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, overview in terminology. The NPA 72, there are two things alarm and emergency communication. Okay. And uh, emergency communication is this is the one interface with the emergency forces notification. It can be one way or two way that uh, uh, the civil defense can might be able to uh, respond back or CNC communication and control no? and alarm signaling uh, within only the protected premises no it's not notifying the uh, post responder protected premises para alarm system in household supervising station and alarm and public emergency alarm reporting system if it is only within the vicinity or or uh, in the uh, <coughs> the premises of the protected uh, facility Anyway, so the NPA is focused in which two types of uh, uh, system. Uh, we discussed this. This is uh, the emergency communication system to be connected uh, to your uh, civil defense or to the first responder and uh, fire alarm system, no? which is uh, on-premises. Uh, emergency communication system is uh, off-premises notification. No? <clears throat> Now let us discuss the uh, overview and terminology. And NPA 72 covers different topics and annexure or appendices and organized into four category. Number one, chapter one to nine, administrative chapter. And chapter 10 to 19, support chapter. Uh, chapter 20 to 29, system chapter. And annexes is the last part no so if you see the administrative chapter until 9 
Okay? Chapter 1, 2, 3 is similar to all NPA coding standard, respective whether it is NPA 1, 10, 11, 13, 20, 22, 23, 25, it's all same. <coughs> because it's about administration and governance. No? Uh, chapter, <coughs> okay, except NPA 70, National Electrical Code and 70E, standard for electrical safety in the workplace. So that's the only exception, 70 and 78. 10 to 9 is support chapter. What makes system do something? How to ensure that the system is operating according to the design intent functionality of use? No? Uh, remember guys that uh, there is a, uh, what's this? Uh, chapter 4 to 6, through to 8 to 9 are not used and not listed are listed as reserved no? it might be used or may not be used in the future edition okay so similar here chapter 11 13 15 16 19 it is vacant meaning not used or reserved again it might be used uh, or not in the future no we don't know when whenever they revise the the standard no? now the system chapter uh, let us look on the headings and the content contained in each chapter. So chapter 21 is emergency control function interface. It is just new, added in 2010. Two consolidate requirements addressing how fire alarm or emergency communication interface and operates with other building. For example, this chapter address requirements for fire alarm and to initiate elevator recall and elevator power shutdown. Okay. Normally, during fire the elevator, uh, it is also interfaced with the fire alarm or if there is an emergency, automatically it will go to the uh, lower ground, no? normally in the ground floor. No? The required performance or where, whenever where is the, the means of escape or uh, means of uh, the most uh, practical means of ingress or escape. The required performance of elevator is covered by different code. Similarly, building and life safety code and NFA 13 address whether or not the automatic sprinkler is required in some elevator. The requirements in NFA 72 are written and coordinated to work hand on hand with this other code and standard. Now, uh, since now there are some premises that uh, interface with the authority or with the uh, regulatory agency or to the first responder, emergency communication system is added in 2010 to consolidate requirements for voice communication and for mass notification. And uh, same thing, 20, 22, 25, 28 are reserved. No? So again, those reserved, we don't know if they will use it in the future or not in the future revision of the uh, NPA edition. Chapter 23 and 29 is the key subject of NPA 72, the protected premises alarm and signaling system, and covered by 23 and single multi multiple station alarm, and the household signaling system are covered in 29. These two types of system are the most common area where NPA 72 is reference and use 26 and 20. You don't need actually to uh, memorize this, but I'm just giving an overview of what it's. Uh, but it's really difficult to memorize. But anyhow, if you will allow, ask me if uh, you can bring the standard to your exam, probably they will allow you to do so. But make sure it is an original copy of NPA, not the photocopy one, or uh, uh, it should be the original book from NPA. No? PTCC 27 address transmission of, of, of signals or premises like to the, if you see, to the power fighter, no? And this system are used to initiate the response of emergency force or the force responder as well as the service and maintenance organization. No? Annexes are not required, meaning not mandatory, uh, meaning you, will not, you should not consider this as a... Uh, 
as a requirement of the the system standard. And next, it just as a further information or details to make it a particular clause or the standard requirement. It's a, normally it is just an explain explanation. Uh, supplementary information. No? Annex A is explanatory material. Additional text to explain requirements. Uh, maybe sometimes you are not really clear on no, what is the requirements all about. So this gives further explanation. Again, explanation is not necessarily the requirement. No? It just used as a guide. No? B is engineering guide for automatic fire detector spacing requirements. C is new to provide guidance on design and performance of protected premises for alarm. Uh, D is speech intelligibility was added in 2010 to address the design, uh, performance and testing of voice communication. Uh, e is a sample ordinance for adopting NPA 72. F is a guidance for testing of various class of circuit. Again guys, all of these are just uh, supplementary material. Serve as a guide. It can consider as a best practice, but not necessarily required. Emergency communication, Annex G, contain guidelines for emergency communication for building in campus. And H, contain guidelines for carbon monoxide detection and warning. So if you see, it's in every annex, there is a specific uh, purpose. I, contains the guidelines for informational reference. No? And uh, the, the I index is great place to start looking when you have a specific question you are trying to answer though. No? If you know the particular terms, go to index and uh, the index will uh, lead you which page, what is the relevant pages or section for that, for that particular term. Overview, overview on how to read. Number one, chapter are organized into section. That's what I, we have seen. Uh, but there are uh, still some section you need to consider that it is reserved. Number two, reference chapter and, and section numbers, not page number. Number three, requirements are more focused further down in the hierarchy and some section open provide ex exception to the general rule in the primary section. <clears throat> there is an, uh, another uh, what we call editorial marks and it is common in all NPA standard. But anyhow, for your information, the asterisk is exploratory material that can be found on Annex A. So if you see clause 3.2.1.1, for example, and there is an asterisk, meaning there is a supplementary explanatory material that you can found on the Annex or Appendix. Huh? If there are bracket, meaning it is a, a clause or a requirement extracted from another NPA document, maybe in NPA 70, for example, no? because NPA 72 is for the fire alarm. And parentheses indicate the committee responsible for that section. Okay, Who is the originator of that idea or that requirement? No? Now the NPA handbook, uh, it's based on uh, a 2019 edition, that is the latest one. And this uh, supplementary document help us understand, implement, and enforce the code, provides NPA 72 text, and contains frequently asked question or FAQ, highlighting key concern and added commentary, explain specific requirements. Include helpful example, table, photo, and many instrumentation. <clears throat> so the question is, which is the following not included in the code? No? Generally, it is the handbook, no? uh, NPA code, and the handbook is actually another, but it's, it's giving more explanation of what is the uh, the code is all about. No? So handbook is another uh, book, different book. No? Another definition, uh, overview, authority having jurisdiction, ASJ, approved versus listed, shall ensure, and uh, the summary. No? The general uh, provision explains where the terms are not defined in this chapter, okay? That is a section 3.1. The section 3.2 is an official definition contains in the NPA bandbook. 3.3, 3, 
contains definition and sub-definition specific to particular document. Overview is uh, includes the explanation of the term found with the code, section and subsection. Uh, the phrase HJ, it means authority having jurisdiction and found frequently throughout the code. It is an organization, maybe an office or uh, an individual responsible to enforce the requirements of the code or standard. The authority having jurisdiction or HJ can be government employee or enforcer, such as par marshal or, or the building inspector. <clears throat> including the maybe the insurance company also no might uh, have an important role Ap uh, approved means the equipment materials or services are acceptable to the authority and if listed means that the equipment material or services in a list that is published by organization acceptable to the authority Normally listed is an organization like uh, UN or FM concerned with evaluation of product and services that maintain periodic inspection and whose listing meet the designated standard and been tested and determined suitable, suitable for its intended use, functionality or use. Okay. Shall means mandatory. Okay, according to your NPA, and should means recommended but not required. So remember, guys, no. So do not enforce something if it is should. Should means not mandatory. It is just recommended. Maybe it's a best practice, but not necessarily required compared to shall. And uh, summary is just. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, is normally at the end of the section uh, of the, the section or chapter which uh, provide a, a brief description of what is that uh, particular section is all about. So what is the meaning of ASJ? That's what we discussed, authority having jurisdiction. So move the box on the right side of the screen to gray the rectangle next to the matching uh, description, a mandatory requirement shall, something acceptable to authority, approve, something recommended but not required, should, and authority uh, published by organization acceptable to the HJ meets other specific criteria meaning listed. You know, this is what we call FM or FM or you listed or approved. Now let us go to condition, signal, response. And this is what the requirements of NPA 72. Condition, signal, and response. Okay, let us discuss the signal. The signal might be electrical communication between the smoke detector and fire alarm in uh, in order to initiate some response by panel. And the signal is obviously a message indicating condition. Okay, so maybe it's a fall or if it's just a false alarm or if there is a, you know, whatever. No? Communicated by electrical visual or the wireless or other means. The signal are used to convey information about condition to initiate response by the occupants or by other types of system, such as elevator or fan. So meaning your uh, elevator or fan, it is also integrated or interface with the fire alarm. If fire alarm, if it is in, integrated with fire alarm, uh, normally the elevator will go to the ground most of the time. If, the, if this is the, uh, the most practical uh, means of egress or fan, normally fan it will shut up. No? Yeah, especially the one uh, the connected uh, uh, air conditioning system like like fire co fire, uh, fan coil unit normally it will turn off okay 
So another signals, no? Are as follow, alarm, carbon monoxide signal, uh, delinquency, evacuation, for alarm, guards, tour, supervisory, pre-alarm, restoration, supervisory, and uh, trouble or fault. No? While there are many types of conditions that warrant different types of response, NEPA defines several specific and commonly used condition signal and response. Again, the condition is a situation. It can be an event for me. Okay. Okay, so or equipment state of a fire alarm or signaling system. No? The conditions are as far normal, meaning normal course of business operation pre-alarm. So before the alarm, no? and alarm condition can be stage one or stage two, and supervisory condition, and trouble if there's fault, and abnormal. So prop normal you might need to do some troubleshooting one of the panel response that is now here we discuss the uh, signal condition now response uh, the response might be to activate occupant notification signal to initiate evacuation or to initiate transmission signal or premises like to the uh, authority or to the uh, let's say civil defense or firefighter and response are performed upon a receipt of a signal. Alarm, pre-alarm, supervisory, or trouble. Normally for us, we will just call for off-premises signal if there is a stage two alarm, making sure that it is not a fault. So a signal convey information about a condition to initiate a response. So that's the correct term again signal could be information about a condition to initiate a response okay so as a summary here what you have learned in this overview explain how the building fire and life safety code impact the requirements for fire detection and alarm number two describe relation between building fire and life safety code product standard and system we discuss and again all of those should, should work together if there are changes from in, in, in one uh, in the one element we need to uh, uh, synchronize to another element determine how NPA 72 is used to build fire detection and alarm number four describe how NPA 72 is structured and there are reserve if you remember including annexure which is just just uh, supplementary material not necessarily required and define specific term used by the code. Shall, should, HJ, etc. Number two, detection and alarm system configuration. We, our objective is to describe characteristics of fire, describe the basic configuration of alarm signaling system, and identify the four basic types of fire alarm circuit. Now let us discuss, anyway, we discuss it many times, but again, we'll go back to the basic what is fire during the initial phase of fire there is a radiant energy you see as the light waves no and this radiant energy can be a hit or can hit other object that it might reach and radiant energy fire detector can be used to detect radiation produced by the fire no? it will also give alarm the plume or hot gas and flame rise from the fire and mix with the cooler air within the room, we call it entrainment. Again, this entrainment it's got, came, out, came out many times in our discussion. Entrainment caused the hot gas to be slightly cooler than those directly above the fire. Increase the volume of gas, causing plume to be wider at the top than it's at the base. This inverted cone has an angle of about 22 degree in total or 11 degree on each side. And this equates to a diameter equal to 40% of the height from the base. Now, as the power plume hits the ceiling and turns horizontally into a ceiling jet, 
as what you can see on the screen, it can form a distinct layer with a depth of about 10% of the height from the base of the fire. Okay, so we discussed it already. Now the question, once combustion begin, how far develop is largely dependent on the following. Okay, how the fire develop, of course, it depends on the uh, many elements, characteristics, and configuration or setup of the facility and what are the fuels or materials involved. No? So that's the answer. Let us discuss detection and alarm system configuration. So we discussed it already before. Smoldering is less efficient than flame. No? Or smoldering means it gives of very little heat, okay? And this is a, uh, uh, and uh, the smoldering also might give some amount of radiation, but less compared to flaming fire, no? And the smoldering is also less efficient compared to the flaming fire. Radiation can be sensed by radiant energy sensing fire detector, but require a specific type of a, a detector with high degree of sensitivity. The problem if your detector has a high sensitivity detection, maybe it will give unwanted alarm even though we do not want you know, this uh, sprinkler to respond when it should not. This is the problem with that. No? Anyway, a far current grow through a sequence of events, which we discussed it many times. No? This is your fire life cycle. So number one, the rate of heat energy near uh, one nearby fuel source. That's number one. Number two, chemical compounds uh, thermally composed into uh, combustible so this is one and this is two a plume or hot gas and flame rise from fire and mix with cooler air with the room that is three the overall room temperature begin to increase for and hot gas begin to spread horizontally across the building which is the five also no? that's it So this is just a sequence, no? Okay, now, uh, again, basic, which we discussed uh, before. Uh, if you remember, we already discussed many times. I think this is the third time now we discussed the stages of fire growth, no? And the growth of fire is dependent on a numerous variable, including the fuel load, ventilation, room size, configuration and other ambient condition. And the selection detection depends on other variable such as ambient temperature, humidity, and presence of dust or aerosol. Let us discuss the fire safety goal. The building and fire codes evolve from tragic event as what we discussed, not from the minor or unreported event. At first, the goals of the fire code were to prevent conflagration of entire city or town, okay? And as a fire safety probe, the fire, so, so before something like this, now it's like this, to avoid the, uh, spreading the fire, no? Minimizing or preventing the spread of fire. As a fire safety probe, fire could be kept to a city block Okay, here, like block. Then to one building and now in one floor. So let's say here. No? Usually designated as a fire area. We can in some case codes expect to keep fire to the room of origin to, to prevent the spread of this fire from one room to another room.
the video you're going to see shows a fire starting as a smoldering fire and transitioning to an open flame fire. And this video will show the, show the growth of the fire within a room in transition of fire to something called flashover, which we discussed numerously previously, where suddenly all combustible in the space ignite at the same time. Okay, so we're lighting the fire. We have a hole actually in the back of the wall. We're lighting the fire from the uh, from the outside. Uh, this is to simulate a drape. So perhaps uh, we we have a lit cigarette that has been dropped into a trash can. Now there, the smoke alarm has gone off. That's probably less than 15 seconds. The temperature right now at the ceiling. After we're not, we're just coming up on 15 seconds now. Now begin to notice the smoke. Notice how thick that smoke is. At this point, uh, the room would be totally unsurvivable, uh, both from the heat and those toxic fumes that are being produced. You can see the heat is now beginning to uh, buckle the plastic on the top. Okay, now the temperature at this point is probably reaching up to about a thousand degrees. All right, in a moment, if you look at the newspaper on the floor, when that ignites, that's about when flashover will occur, which is just about now. Okay, now we are full flash over now, the room is fully engulfed, and the firefighters are going in to extinguish. Now folks, the total elapsed time on that, from the ignition to the time we began putting the fire out, was one minute and 30 seconds. So when, when people say you don't have much time to get out of a burning house, now you can see why. Okay, and there again, we go. No accelerants of any kind were used. That was just rubber two and fabric. Same scenario with a sprinkler. Now here again, you should hear the smoke alarm go off first. 15 to 20 seconds. Here's the smoke alarm. We're about uh, 25 to 30 seconds in now. And there goes the sprinkler. It activated. And the fire is well contained, probably out at this point. We're going to go ahead and shut down the, uh, the sprinklers themselves now. Okay, now what happened here is when the temperature in that room got up to about 135 degrees, it activated the sprinkler. Now, in 90% of the cases, only one sprinkler head goes off. So, yes, there is a bit of water damage, but the water damage that a single sprinkler head causes compared to the kind of damage you'd have going into a blazing room like this with fire hoses is minimal. The long smoldering depends on the fuel and the fuel configuration, ignition source, and availability of oxygen. No smoldering for spill or flammable liquids ignited by open vein. The kitchen fire involves grease or oil, but probably there's no smoldering. That's one of the examples. And a smoldering fire uh, uh, ignited by smoking material, improperly used extension cord or other source of heat, are some of the examples of smoldering fire.
the most common use of protected premises for alarm is a building for alarm system or FAS. However, they may also be used as a de dedicated function for alarm or a releasing for alarm system. Okay. And the other use of protected fire alarm, dedicated function for alarm and releasing fire alarm. That has shown that no, the configuration of protection and alarm. The combination of automatic and manual initiating device is to evacuate, relocate during fire. That's one of the objective. Another objective is to report to a premises location for summoning emergency services when required. If there is an interface. No? And prepare building and system for controlling the fire. No? So H means a detector. And uh, S is the smoke detector, and F is uh, uh, the, the, the fire alarm. Okay. Initiating device, those HSF, provide an input to the fire alarm control unit, which we call FACU, and are either manually actuated, no? such as manual fire alarm, this uh, fire alarm box, which is F, also called pull station, as what I mentioned earlier. So F means pull station or fire alarm box. No? Or automatic actuated, that's what we discussed, the HNS, no? such as your smoke or heat detector. In the image you saw, the symbol on the far left is heat detector, H. Okay, the second is smoke and the third is manual fire alarm, which is F. And using the condition we mentioned earlier, no? the condition signal response model, automatic fire detector is used to sense a change in environmental condition. That is the purpose of the uh, sense in a change. No? If it's not automated, we will do it manually because we can also sense if there are unusual condition. Once the condition detected automatically or by a person who manually initiate the fire alarm, a signal is sent to the control unit or what you call the fire alarm control unit. <clears throat> the control unit or the, the panel is the hub of the system. Hub means HUB. Receive info from environmental sensor designated to detect changes associated with smoke or fire, then monitor them and provide automatic control of equipment and the transmission of information necessary to prepare the structure for fire based on predetermined sequence. Now, the panel supplies with electrical energy, which is your primary power, to operate any associated initiating device, H, S, or F, either the control relay also, notification appliance, that's what you see as an output of your fire alarm control unit, or transmitter, no, which is an output transmitter maybe it will go to another interface to another system building system uh, equipment you know, such as elevator uh, transmitter uh. one of the most important use of control unit is to signal notification appliance uh, your home and strobe to turn on to notify building occupants in case of the fire and to notify building occupants of the need to, if there's a fire, of course, the need to evacuate or relocate. Now, your notification appliance, such as the bid notification appliance on another way around, an audible notification appliance or combination of both use energy supplied from primary or secondary power, the primary source of power is not available, to inform the occupants of the need to response. No? normally to evacuate the facility or premises. In the image, the circuit on the right 
as a combination of audible and visual appliance. And audible or visual appliance is a, a symbol from NPA 170, 170, you see symbols in accordance with 2018 edition of NPA 170. And to, in order to make it reliability operate 24 seven, meaning 24 hours, seven days in a week, the control unit needs power and which should have at least two source of power. The primary power is alternating current maybe 120 to 240 volt and for protected premises fire alarm a brand circuit is dedicated solely to the fire alarm the secondary or backup power provides energy if there is no primary power or there is a primary power fail and usually consists of sealed lead acid storage battery or other emergency source such as generator it can be also a secondary power in addition to notifying occupants, the building fire alarm might be designed to control or interface with other system. Emergency control function allows the fire alarm to control aspect of environment, such as this disabling elevator or and unlocking the fire door. So that is your transmitter. No? And different type of transmitter can be used for sending alarm or the trouble or supervisor signal to emergency force such as to your fire or police or any first responder. It may be also private company supervising the station or public fire and police dispatcher and public safety answering point. So let us uh, determine what is missing uh, in this picture. So, uh, very easy. No? Here we have the initiating no? device, which is input. No? So all of these guys is input, including this uh, primary power and backup or secondary power, such as battery or uninterruptible power supply, UPS, no? through alternate uh, transfer switch, ATS, or secondary power. This is your uh, fire control, fire alarm uh, control unit. And these are your uh, notification appliance. This is your uh, horn. And this is your strobe. No? Here we have emergency control function. Let's say notifying the occupant. No? or the uh, off-premises off-premises first responder such as police or fire and transmitter which is uh, connected to another building or interface rather that's the term with another building system so that's all which is very uh, simple okay so I hope you still remember it might come in your exam let us discuss detection and alarm system. So again, it can be manual, which is designated as uh, <clears throat> F, no? and uh, automatic can be H or S, H heat detector or smoke detector. Now the manual and automatic initiating, initiating device can be conventional or addressable, even your uh, Addressable means two-way. No? Uh, here in uh, two-way, very simple. The problem with conventional, you will know which area or location, which has a problem, but you will not know a specific device. In addressable, since two-way, the, the specific device will also transmit a signal that he or she is the one getting the uh, changes in the environment. No? that is addressable. You can determine the specific type of device compared to conventional. Maybe in, in conventional, it's just a zone or area, but you will never be able to de determine the specific problematic devices. 
and initiating device are assumed to be alarm and supervisory. Now, in alarm, if we will use it as an alarm initiating device, no? uh, one is the smoke detector, initiate alarm, response upon alarm control unit, which is an input to your FACU, and sprinkler bar stamper switch, initiate a supervisory signal for the fire alarm control unit. Sprinkler bulbs, this one will uh, give uh, if it is connected to your uh, piping. No? Well, if there is a flow of uh, water inside, okay, and it, if it will move the plastic clapper inside this uh, uh, sprinkler bulb tamper switch, it will give signal that this uh, zone, okay. Uh, this zone is actually activating the uh, sprinklers or I don't know, maybe pre-action or deluge, but the zone of fire suppression system initiate those system. No? Control units, there are two things, monitor input. What is that? Uh, that is building fire alarm system. Inputs are from initiating device, H, S, and F. And output, common output activation of occupant notification appliance or interface to another system. And control units can be uh, LED, addressable, or uh, operator. Okay. Just remember, guys, that the most common output of building fire alarm is activation of occupant notification appliance. No? And the fire alarm control unit also control relay or provide area to another system to control emergency function, such as elevator record, as what we discussed earlier, or unlock the door, which is commonly, normally locked, but if during emergency, it must be unlocked. No? A smaller system or conventional zone system can have a simple display with LED to indicate which zone is alarm or supervisory mode. It would also have a yellow LED to indicate when the circuit had a subtype of fault, also known as trouble signal yellow. Addressable system and uh, many newer zone systems use to display to indicate the status of the system and larger and more complex system may have multiple operator interface panel, might need additional control for making voice announcement and for controlling the building features such as fan, elevator, and doors. Most notification is uh, intended to initiate occupant evacuation and sometimes relocation if it is hospital, for example, which most of the patient is incapable of cell preservation. The means different may be according to the situation. If the notification is used in public school, might be different used in nursing home. In some situations, staff is needed to implement evacuation. Notification appliance can be audible, visual, tactile, or textual stimuli to alert the occupants. Maybe there's a case of fire. And the evacuation signal may consist of audible or visual appliance, horn and strobe with a distinct audible tone. The speaker can deliver the live or pre-recorded instruction to the building occupant. Many types of uh, transmitter no, are used to send info from a protected premises to either supervising station alarm or to a public emergency alarm reporting system. For example, if you will use your community public emergency alarm reporting system, that transmitter will have to be the one that is compatible with that. Uh, compatibility is important. No? So before you procure anything, check your local uh, uh, interfacing authority requirements. No? The most common types of transmitter for this are master box and radio box, okay?
if you plan to have one of the NPA 72 recognized supervis supervising station alarm system and other types of transmitter, no, such as digital Arab communication transmitter and internet provider IP, you can also use that no, to communicate off-premise. No. Transmitter may be integral part of the building fire alarm or can be add up units or extra no, interface to building fire alarm. Emergency control interface and the code required verification upon system acceptance at least once a year. No? So meaning there should be an annual verification for activating emergency control function interface because we want to make sure that again that these devices are uh, uh, working according to the design functionality intended or use. Some example, elevator record initiated by certain smoke and heat detector, not manual parallel box and other initiating device. Let us discuss though, the 120 volt or 240 volt AC source from a commercial power utility. We discuss that that is a, a primary source of power. No? Primary source of power. Provides input to the fire alarm control unit and either manually activated such as full station or automatically actuated. Uh, that is an example of initiating device, no? which is H, S, and F. H stands for heat detector, S is book, then F is your uh, fire alarm manual pullbacks. Users energy supply from a fire alarm system will back energy source to inform the occupants of the need to take action. This is your notification appliance, no? such as your horn and strobe, or live or pre-recorded public uh, alarm or uh, voice evacuation system. Usually consists of seed lead acid storage battery or other emergency source. This is your secondary power. And sometimes it can be generator also. Secondary power. Let's say battery and uh, generator. And lastly, allow fire alarm system to control aspects of the environment such as disabling elevator. And this is your emergency control function, no? which is your transmitter, emergency control functions, okay. not just a transmitter, guys, okay. Why I can delete this one? So that's what you see, okay? Let us discuss the fire alarm circuit. In fire alarm, components are connected with circuit and it, it is those that get power from the fire alarm control unit. Again, such as your horn or strobe. Primary and secondary power are not fire alarm circuit. For emergency control function, a fire alarm circuit may be used to control the relay that switch a control unit that is powered by emergency control function equipment. <laughs> anyway, here, just remember that there are types of fire alarm circuit, initiating device ID, signaling line circuit, I, initiating device circuit is IDC, then signaling line circuit, SLD, notification appliance circuit, NAC, and control circuit, which is your CC, okay.
Now, this is the example of single line circuit no, that provide two-way communication between addressable parallel and addressable field. Okay. This is another type of notification applied circuit. It is shown and part of the group. Fire alarm control panel turned on circuit and operates all appliance. Anyway, which are four types of circuit used in fire alarm? So I don't remember TC or take care, no? so that's only. CC, IDC, SLC, that you see here, no? initiating device, signaling line, notification appliance, and control units. These are adhere with TTC, CC, IDC, SLC. Sorry, TTC, no? until NAC only. No? Okay, so this is the answer. Let us discuss the summary. Yeah, in this uh, section of detection and alarm system configuration, we describe the characteristic of fire, describe the basic configuration of fire detection and alarm, and identify the, the, the four types of fire alarm. Okay. So let us uh, have a break first before we continue control unit and power supply discussion. Okay. Please have a break and we will come back at after 15 minutes.
So let's just re uh, resume our discussion. Okay, let us discuss control unit in power uh, supply. In the, our large objective is to list the key requirements for primary power and to protection of primary power. List the option of secondary power supply. And uh, uh, we will also make a battery calculation. So in this section, many electrical contractor run the primary power to fire alarm control units every day. Some have performed this job installation many times that it becomes almost second nature to them. However, there must always abide by NPA 72 specific requirements that must be followed and in addition to the requirements of NPA 70 or national fire alarm code. The power source option, NEPA 72, the NEPA National Fire Alarm and Signaling Code specify the power requirements for the fire alarm system. A system must either have a two source of power, primary and secondary, or an energy storage system or what we call ESS. That is an ESS option. Where the primary or secondary power are used, the secondary supply can consist of battery or plus a generator. No? In general practice, the most common configuration is to provide <coughs> primary power plus a full complement of battery. <coughs> the second most common configuration is a primary power with a generator and a smaller set of uh, battery. In that configuration, the generator is backing up or supporting the primary power you know, in case there is a power failure. And the battery are provided to supply the system while the generator starts or in case the generator fails to start. Most generator will have a delay before they turn on to provide the power. And the last option, primary power plus ESS is really providing a high reliable primary power supply. In most situations that use the UPS option, the control unit will still require a small set of battery because the control unit will be in trouble without them. <clears throat> most systems use uh, commercial light and power sources for the primary power supply. Note that the generator option listed for primary power is not a backup generator. Rather, it is one that might provide normal or everyday power for building or an entire site. <coughs> From the perspective of the fire alarm, a cogeneration system is a generator. We call it cogeneration because it's either generate additional power supplied into the public grid or because heat is extracted and used to heat the building. Most commercial power can be traced back to a generator somewhere. And the key requirement that is that the primary power must be supplied by a dedicated branch circuit so no other system or equipment can be powered from the same circuit. Meaning, for example, you won't be able to install an electrical receptacle or a circuit for technician to use when servicing the system. Dedicated branch circuit is not limited to serving only the power supply within a system. It might be able to supply several power supply with a control unit or within multiple interconnected units serve the signaling system. And there is no requirement 
okay in npa to for the power to be tap i have to be disconnect and the dedicated branch circuit may become may come from a sub panel most system which use of the following for their primary power supply and the obvious answer is the commercial light and power <coughs> no a key requirement for primary power is that it must be supplied by dedicated branch circuit that is correct now let us discuss the labeling and protection of primary power the npa national fire alarm signaling code npa 72 required that the circuit disconnecting means be labeled fire alarm the marking must be red in color if you see fa no labeling must be red here <coughs> here <clears throat> the new requirement is that where a circuit breaker is used as the disconnecting means of breaker locking device must be installed the code also required that the location of the circuit disconnecting means identified at the control unit so that the service technician know where to go to the to disconnect power to a control unit So this one no? is your uh, label, no? A red label here, and it must be red. The option for secondary or backup power consists of battery or combination of, as what we discussed earlier, backup generator and battery, and the secondary power. Must have stored capacity, ability to supply power that will meet the system demand over a set period of time. The capacity of energy to be stored depends on the demand, also called the load, or the rate of consumption for for the duration over which the demand must met. The total energy requirement affects the size of the battery. Of course, the the more load are there, expect a bit a a bigger size of battery. And where generation is used, generator, the amount of fuel that is stored. <clears throat> for for a basic fire alarm system that use primary power within a battery, only a secondary power, the battery capacity must be sufficient. Just remember this, guys. To operate in a system, a non-alarm condition, non-alarm condition, 24 hours, then it must be still able to operate all of its associated alarm notification for a period of five minutes at least. So non-alarm condition, 24 hours. Alarm notification appliance connected load, additional. Okay. Ah. Uh, For a period of five minutes, okay, and the code specify that the net capacity be based on the two different demand rate, uh, the the quiescent and alarm for two different duration, 24 hour and five minutes, meaning additional five minutes load, no? and emergency communication system or ECS is used for. Mass notification or in building fire emergency voice alarm communication system, minimum 24 hour non alarm condition, but require 15 minutes of full load alarm capacity. This is required because this type of system operated for longer period during emergency. The system might battery be used for 30 to 60 minutes under partial load. As announcement are made to certain floor, okay. for a system that use that use battery, once the required battery size is calculated, the code requires the minimum 20% safety factor to be added. So we have a safety factor of uh, 20% in your uh, uh, in addition to your load requirements, no? 
here another net capacity 24 hours and five minutes because five minutes is uh, for other connected loads for additional five minutes ECS 24 hour non alarm condition but requires minimum 15 minutes full load alarm capacity and provide longer periods of operation during an emergency. <clears throat> because uh, the ECS or uh, emergency communication system that used for mass communication normally requires minimum 15 minutes of full load alarm capacity. So that's the requirement there. Okay. <clears throat> now you have the basic fire alarm system that use primary power with the battery only as secondary power. The core specify that the net capacity be based on the two demand rates. <clears throat> the the question and alarm for two, two different situations. What are they? We discuss 24 hours and an extra five minutes you know, for other loads. Okay. <clears throat> if a secondary power <clears throat> for a protected premises is used as an automatic starting generator serving the primary power branch circuit in a set of storage batteries dedicated to the alarm, what is the required capacity of the battery? It should be uh, four hours according to your NPA 72. Okay. Generator and battery option. Except for the secondary battery, the primary power and alternative primary produce power produced by generator are fed through common circuit. No special protection is required for that circuit, but it is recommended. The generator must have a class 24 rating, which means it must be capable of operating for a full 24 hours at its rated load. That is the capacity of the required uh, generator uh, class 24. No? Since generator has to be able to handle the greatest load possible, it must have sufficient fuel capacity. So meaning the fuel capacity also is depends. Uh, it should also be designed to supply operating for full 24 hours in full alarm mode. If generator supply other loads as well, no problem, but it must be included in the fuel capacity calculation. And the requirement fuel capacity for generator operating at full load will usually be calculated by the generator manufacturer or the supplier or the specialist. So again, generator specification class 24, meaning capable of operating for full 24 hour and a straight load and there should be a sufficient load fuel capacity if it's used for other purpose it must be also part of the calculation it must be added but for the full alarm mode minimum 24 hours operation and that's the amount of fuel required <clears throat> note that if generator supply other load must be included in the fuel capacity calculation we discussed and the required fuel capacity for generator operating a full load will usually be calculated by generator manufacturer or supplier. Uninter uninterruptible power supply option. When the ESS option is used to provide secondary power, ESS must be class 24, meaning 24 hours of capacity must be provided. And the type, and the code also requires type O, ESS, means that the system is always running on the battery, even when main, main power is operational. In other words, there is no switch over to batteries upon loss of the incoming power, not even for a fraction or second. A level one ESS rating 
apply where a failure of equipment to perform could result in loss of human life or serious injury. And uh, an ESS is hardwired to control unit at a common plug in type. No? So that's the requirements of the code. It is used on many home and small business computer system. When an ESS is used, there is no other power input into the power, into the panel, I mean. Okay, and all input by single circuit and no special requirements for protection. So with generator, we should consider the hazards and resulting risk associated with the single circuit serving such an important role. Let us uh, perform an example of uh, battery calculation. We have five steps. Most manufacturers now offer battery calculation spreadsheet or Excel spreadsheet for their equipment. And generally from manufacturer's website, but a pull down menu that makes calculation easy and fast. Okay. So step one, gather all the equipment and determine the quantity and it's determined also, of course, uh, the equipment load. No? So gather the specification sheet for all the equipment on the system. And list each piece of equipment and quantity for each and every piece of equipment. The data sheet will list required standby current in ampere or amps. <clears throat> Step three, multiply the quantity of particular piece of equipment times the standby current up to get a total number of amps for that piece of equipment standby mode. And add the figures for all pieces of equipment to get the total standby current in amps. In this case, we got 0.9253 amps. So here, what we got is 0.9253. So we'll round up to a whole number later. This is how much current system draw when it is in normal mode without alarm. Next, do the same for all alarms current for each uh, equipment. So this one for normal, no? and for alarm mode, no, we need also to consider we are getting 5.1261 amps. Now uh, required standby is 24 hours. And uh, if you remember, uh, enter required alarm time should be minimum five minutes. No? So 24 hours and five minutes, remember, and five minutes is equivalent to, if you divide by 60, it's about 0 0.0833 hours. So five divided by 60, 0 0.0833. So 24, 0 0.0833 hours. <clears throat> so 24 hours plus 0 0.0833 hours. And we calculated the total standby current is 92529 per hour. No, So amp hour, no? 0.925353 amp hour multiplied by 24 to make it 24 hours, 22.2070 amp hours. After you're done with calculating the total alarm current, the next step is to multiply the total standby current by 24 hours to get in case 22.2070 amp hour. Okay, very simple calculation. Now we need to add the the alarm capacity. Now, if you remember, uh, <clears throat> our uh, alarm current is 5.1261 amp hour. Okay, which is the which is the <clears throat> uh, what's this? Uh, multiply by five minutes, no? Because it's remember 24 hours for standby or normal mode and for alarm mode five minutes. Uh, of, you will get 5.1261 multiplied by 0 0.0833 it's equal to 0 0.4272 amp hour so if we will if we will add 24 hours and 5 minutes required amp hour no we will get 22.6 amp hour no and remember we have the required factor of safety of 20% no and again, it is a good practice to base the battery calculation on all circuits being lo loaded to the limit of the equipment, ensure that almost any changes made to the system during installation or during subsequent use of the system over its lifetime will not exceed the available battery capacity. 
next and the required 20% factor of safety to arrive so at the final battery size. So what you will do, 22.6 multiplied by 1.2. So what is the 20% of 22.6? That is around 4.5 amp hours. So 22.6 plus uh, 4.5 hours, you will get 27 amp hours now. <clears throat> so here there is a question so I will uh, give, give it as an assignment you can uh, follow the same calculation but again you need to calculate it in uh, 24 hours and uh, for normal power required and uh, standby and 5 minutes for the uh, during the during the fire alarm no? and you should get 63.5 17 amp hour. No? This is the calculation. Standby current required 1.935 ampere and alarm for alarm 3.1 ampere. That is for up hour per five minutes per floor multiplied by eight hour. So we use 15 minutes of all connected load. So high rise. So this is a calculation. Standby capacity that, that should be multiplied by 24. Alarm capacity multiplied by uh, in eight floor multiplied by uh, 0.25. <clears throat> and the uh, total capacity you have to multiply up. You need to add 46.44 amp hour plus 6.2. So you will get <clears throat> 52.64 and safety factor uh, that which is. Uh, 1.2 so 52.64 multiplied by 1.2 63.17 okay anyway you can also ask the manufacturer to do the same calculation and in your exam you're not expecting any calculation this is just for your knowledge no? what is the requirements of the, the building code select the three statements that are true about secondary power uh, there are three possible uh, uh, answer here okay so one is the the capacity of energy to be stored depends on the demand and the duration over which the demand must be met the option for secondary power are either battery or standalone backup generator load. it should be a standard battery and standalone backup generator a secondary power system must have either stored capacity or ability to discharge at a rate which will make the system demand over time. Battery required 20% safety margin. Okay. So that's all. And the summary, we list the key requirements for the primary power and for the protection of primary power. The option for secondary supply and perform, perform the battery calculations, which you can also check uh, if our answer is correct. No? I don't know if we still have time. Yes, we still have time. And uh, uh, I'll give you now the, the question. Okay, and you can uh, start answering. Um, So now uh, I already provided the link and you have 15 minutes to answer. Please start.
All right, so let us continue. For the answer. Anyway, I just want to mention Mr. Conran. He got 10 out of 10. Uh, Mr. Uh, Norman, he got 70%. Okay, anyway. Meaning 70% is the, the passive score. And you will uh, see that in your uh, digital receipt. Let us answer. Which of the following is the true? Uh, the the true not true here meaning the, the wrong answer is which is the right answer is a quote tells you how to do what the product standards say you need to do. Okay, which is B. NPA seventy two focus on fire alarm system in which other type of system? Emergency communication system ESS now. Building and life safety code, fire code, elevator, and mechanical code have which of the following? They contain reference to NPA 72C. So all of that we discussed earlier. Number four, NPA 72 define the level of performance and reliability of the following. ESS emergency communication system. And after is following a section number in NPA 72, the dots by which not only 72 in all NPA code, B, there is related material in Annex A. The characteristics and configuration of fuel involved. A major factor, how fast fire develop uh, based on the available oxygen. No? True entrainment. What type of fire produce large visible solid and liquid particles of smoke? Smoldering, smoldering fire or fire that are oxygen starved. Which of the following is true statement? Emergency control function help protect the building from fire. And which of the following is a key requirement in NPA 72 primary power must be supplied by dedicated brass circuit. We discussed that. And you have, <clears throat> okay, how long must the battery be able to operate all of the system associated alarm? So during alarm, all connected loads at least five minutes. No? Stand by 24 hours. Okay. So that's all for tonight. And actually, no, this is our last uh, section. Um, after this, we will be having a three series of mock exam, no? which we will give on uh, uh, next meeting, uh, Tuesday, uh, sorry, Monday, Wednesday. And, and uh, so three more uh, meetings, but that dedicated to your mock exam for us to determine if you are ready no, uh, to take your uh, final exam. And I am encouraging you now to book your exam as uh, as much as possible because our question bank still relevant to your current exam. Most of them no, uh, enough for you to pass the exam. Okay, and we added some new uh, answers relevant to your exams also no okay so that's all for tonight and good luck to your mock exam and to your actual exam